You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. This time, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Guerin, Assistant Professor at the United States Military Academy at West Point and Deputy Director for the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. He's also the author of Comrades Betrayed, Jewish World War I Veterans Under Hitler, which was released in 2020. Dr. Guerin, how's it going today? Wesley, things are going really good, and, and thank you for that a wonderful and, and kind introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, since you mentioned that I uh, that I teach at West Point, I should start out by saying that the views and opinions expressed by me do not necessarily state or reflect those of the U.S. Military Academy, the Department of the Army, or the Department of Defense. Uh, but it's great to be here, Wesley. Excellent. With the, the legalese out of the way, let's just uh, jump right in. So one of the things I'm always quite cautious about when we are talking about the past in general, but also when we're talking about veterans during the First World War or any other conflict, is we don't want to create like artificial divisions. So when we're discussing German Jewish veterans that served at the front in the German army, were they in any way different than the other millions of German soldiers? You know, did they experience discrimination? Was there wartime or were there wartime experiences as a whole different than any other soldiers? That is a, a, a really good question, and uh, it, it was that question among among several others, of, of course, but that, that was one of the main questions that was uh, driving my interest in this topic originally uh, many years ago. And um, in answering that, I, I should start off by saying that, um, that anti-Semitism was prevalent in Germany. Um, there were certainly negative anti-stereotypes uh, of Jews in, in, in Imperial Germany before 1914. But I would argue not not more so than in other European countries, and perhaps not even more so than in the United States. In Germany specifically, um, Jews were stereotyped as being insufficiently patriotic, uh, that they embraced socialism, and uh, that they embraced the, the left, um, left side of the political spectrum. And especially for Jewish men, there were stereotypes as uh, of Jewish men uh, of as being effeminate, as being physically weaker, as not being as as hardy as your average German men, and uh, in, in the army, they uh, you know there is a, a notion that Jews were mainly good for desk duty and rather than service in the front line. And these stereotypes they had consequences, and and we can see the impact of these stereotypes uh, when we look at uh, the German military. Uh, the German officer corps, for example, was uh, was one institution in Germany where these stereotypes were were um, were, were were quite significant, embraced by a large percentage of the of the of of the members there. There were no Jewish officers uh, in Germany before 1914. There was one exception to that. That was Bavaria. They had uh, they, they they had about 50 or 60 reserve officers, but. Uh, but there were no active duty officers in the German military before 1914, largely as a result of, of, these, of these stereotypes. So um, in, in 1914, when, when World War I broke out, many Jews who were overwhelmingly middle class, upper middle class, and actually belonged to the conservative um, side of the political spectrum, many of them saw World War I as an opportunity. Because this was a, an opportunity to destroy these stereotypes, to overturn this this negative image of uh, the Jewish man Jewish man as effeminate, and and turn it on its head. And uh, Jews, uh, many Jews, they they eagerly embraced the war. There were 
a large number of uh, war volunteers at the beginning and Jews served in the front lines in the same proportions as, uh, as non-Jewish Germans. Um, and indeed, in the, at the front, you know, in the, you know, as uh, infantrymen and as, as, as artillerymen, uh, for people involved in actual combat, uh, Jews found, formed a, a powerful solidarity with their uh, Christian, uh, with their non-Jewish comrades at the front. And this is uh, borne out in letters written from the, letters from the field, uh, diaries written at the time, contemporary sources. That, um, that that portray the front lines, you know, as as a, as a place where, where Jews were not uh, discriminated against, or a place where Jews were, um, yeah, were excluded because of their their Jewishness. These are things uh, that that didn't come up in the at the at, at the front while units were in, involved in combat. Um, there were anti to be sure there were anti Semites um, in, in in the German army, but. The amazing thing, or the remarkable thing, is that, is that many of them served side by side with Jews during the war. Uh, this did not impact morale or affect uh, unit cohesion at the front. And it's borne out uh, by figures. Um, in World War I, 35,000 Jewish soldiers were decorated for bravery or meritorious service. And at least 2,000, this is a, a low number, at least 2,000 were commissioned as officers were promoted into the officer ranks. So there was a real, um, you know, I, 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 I mean, anti-Semitism did manifest itself during the war and Jews experienced it. But, uh, but in general, uh, Jews felt that um, uh, the war had been a positive experience. And this was um, a time where, where they belonged to the greater whole. This is how they described their war experience. Um, but I know that during the war, uh, there was an event that, that you referenced in your book a few times called the, the Jew Count, uh, which seemed to be pretty important during the war and certainly after. Could you talk a little bit about what this count was and uh, why it would be what I might call like weaponized after the war by certain groups sort of in post-war Germany? Yeah, Wesley, that's also a, a very good question. And the Jew Count... Um... And, and uh, briefly, the Jew count was a, uh, an anti-Semitic census that was conducted by the German general staff, uh, by the German war ministry in October, November 1916. And its purpose was to determine the number of Jews serving in the front lines in proportion to the number of, uh, of non-Jewish Germans. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a little bit of context is, is, is important here. Um, 1916, as as you know, and as most of your listeners know, I mean, this was a, a, a fateful year for Germany, not just for for Germany, but uh, especially for Germany. The war hung in the in the balance here. Um, their offensive at uh, Verdun had just failed. Um, they had taken uh, heavy losses at at the at, at, at the Somme, and uh, they uh, a new leadership team had just uh, had just taken charge in Germany: Hindenburg and Ludendorff. And one of the per, one of the reasons, one of the purposes of the Hindenburg program, which was being instituted that year, was to uh, what was to was to take was to use all available manpower um, in Germany and, uh, and 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 give that to the army, bring it into the army, and especially provide manpower and material to the front line. So everywhere um, in, in in Germany, in, in German industry, in in German army units and rear echelon units, there was a um, the army was looking for people who were superfluous, who were shirking duty, who should really be serving at the, at the front lines. Um, and one of the, uh, while this was going on, uh, there were also rumors that were, uh, that had been spread mainly by anti-Semitic organizations and a, and a few anti-Semitic officers, rumors stating that, uh, Jews were also responsible for shirking their duty. They, they were, they weren't uh, sacrificing in the same numbers as uh, as other Germans, and as a result of these rumors, which if, uh, uh, eventually made their way to the German War Ministry as the Hindenburg program was being administered, as a result of that, the ministry carried out the census uh, that we just talked about. The census was supposed to be de- uh, was supposed to determine if these rumors were true, if Jews were in, in, in fact. Uh, serving disproportionately in the rear lines and these comfortable rear area postings while quote unquote real Germans were fighting and dying at the at the front lines. 
So this census, it, it required all, uh, it, again, in October, November 19, uh, for, uh, 1916 uh, is, when, uh, is, is when the census was instituted. It required uh, commanders down to the company to level to uh, physically count all the Jewish soldiers serving in their, in their company, in their, in their battalions, um, those serving in the front line in fighting, in, in, in a fighting role, and those serving um, you know, in desks or something or um, in, in supply, um, and also tally the number of Jews or who had been uh, wounded in action, who had been decorated for bravery. And, um, and they believed that this was going to provide um, evidence. The war ministry believed that this was going to provide evidence of, of of uh, of Jews not serving in adequate numbers, but uh, in, in fact that that wasn't the case. Uh, the little evidence we do have is that uh, this uh, that this uh, that this census proved uh, quite the opposite that Jews were serving in um, equivalent numbers. Uh, the problem, though, is is that the War Ministry never publicized the, its findings. These statistics were, were were buried, and to this day they haven't been made public. Um, so this this uh, caused some this this um, from the very beginning this um, this started to uh, stoke some uh, controversy and uh, made for conspiracy theories, especially especially after the war, especially um, after 1918, as uh, people were looking for a scapegoat. And the only thing that the German public knew uh, about the survey is number one that it was being uh, conducted, uh, that that a, that a survey was carried out. Um, and it was being carried out because there were rumors of Jewish uh, shirking. So these two bits of information were the basis for conspiracy theories after 1918 that led to, that led to the uh, myth of the, the stab in the back, this notion that uh, Jews, among many other groups, had been complicit in betraying Germany in World War I and were responsible for its downfall. I think uh, it's that that kind of census is a, a really good example of how you know like societal discrimination can kind of manifest in these situations where you know these these groups within German society were able to push the the, the war ministry and the high command to to do this census probably based on very flimsy information that they may have had about events or third hand knowledge or whatever and then mm -hmm. when it happens it doesn't actually prove that they were accurate or or correct right. Right, exactly. And many officers, um, be, you know, before 1916, they were also hearing these rumors, but they dismissed them out of hand. It was really when you had Hindenburg Ludendorff coming in, they, they had a series of personnel changes and the war ministry. And for the first time, they weren't just brushing these rumors off. They were taking them seriously and looking to find out if, if this was this was really true. So one of the things you, you do a lot in your book is you actually pull firsthand accounts of people who were at the front lines, these actual Jewish soldiers. Is there any kind of um, account or, or event that kind of sticks out in your mind um, after you know, reading through all of those uh, memoirs and diaries? Yeah, Wesley, that is, that is, a, that is an interesting question. And um, I, I did have the, the, the privilege of, of, of going through a lot of uh, Jewish writings uh, from the First World War, a lot of a lot of uh, letters, a lot of uh, diary entry entries, and even some uh, testimonies that were written uh, directly after after 1918, shortly after Jews returned home. And, and one of the um, one, one of one of the most interesting accounts from the war itself uh, was a, a Jewish lieutenant who was was killed in 1918 um, and during the during the final spring offensives. Um, and when he was killed, uh, his wife uh, collected uh, his, his, his papers. Um, they, she eventually uh, made it to the United States, so they reside at the Leo, in, uh, Leo Beck Institute in New York. And going through these papers, um, I, I discovered a trove of letters that had been uh, written between this one uh, Jewish lieutenant, Lieutenant uh, Beutla, and he was corresponding with, uh, with, with a friend of his, another uh, fellow officer who had served in the same unit. And, and later, uh, he was transferred to a different company. Hence, there were writing, exchanging um, some letters. And what was interesting here is, uh, is uh, this Jewish lieutenant's comrade was, uh, he, he was, he was, uh, he, he was, he was non-Jewish and he was, um, and he was a, a, a pronounced anti-Semite. And in these letters, they uh, they debated the so-called Jewish questions, 
um, the so-called right in, of, of Jews to be in Germany, the place of Jews in, in Germany. Um, and they went back and forth on, on whether Jews uh, were, uh, were ethnically, whether, whether they were German or not, whether it was true that Jews uh, really were pulling their weight in, in World War I. And by the end of that letter exchange, um, it didn't seem like um, Lieutenant Beutler had, had changed his, his comrade's mind on this, that this other German officer was very rigid in his, in his views. But um, it's amazing that somehow this, this uh, really this, this uh, anti-Semitic nationalist, something who had nothing in common with his, with his uh, a Jewish friend, they, uh, they nevertheless served in the same unit and, uh, and they were friends. And, and he saw him as kind of exceptional. He, he made it an, an exceptional for this, uh, this just Jewish comrade. And I think this, you know, mainly because of the experiences, experiences that they overcame together in the front line. And I think this shows uh, this relationship more than anything. It, it shows that um, that men of completely different uh, backgrounds, political persuasions, and um, even even um, ideologies like this, um, it, in the front lines, they were able uh, to serve together at the exigencies of combat. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic example. Um, but you know, after 1918, the soldiers do return home from the front where maybe maybe the specific situations were different between individuals and when they returned home you know the nation was flirting with revolution was in the midst of revolution depending on sort of how you track things and i was surprised to read in your book that there were many jewish individuals who joined the free corps a group with some very strong anti-semitic leaders and very strong anti-semitic actions yeah, you you are right. I devote a, a couple. There, uh, many Jews did do, uh, join the Fry Corps, and I devote a, a couple of pages to that in my book. And it's interesting that you that you um, that, that you asking me this question now because it's a topic um, um I'd like to expand, and, I, and I'm working on right now on on on, on, on uh, writing about this a little bit more because it's it is fascinating. And um, years ago, when I first came across this, it was uh, it was uh, it was very perplexing because uh because the fry corps they are really portrayed as the forerunners or the harbingers of the the national socialist movement um as herman goering um himself said in in 1933 uh the members of the free corps they were the quote unquote first soldiers of the third reich um they were largely seen as um as uh, it, the, the free corps it was a militia that was formed in already 19 november 1918 they they formed first uh free corps militias and especially in uh, 1919 they were deployed throughout germany these were volunteer militias mainly comprised of ex soldiers and their job was to really put down communist insurrections that were springing up uh, throughout uh, germany Later, they would go um, on to Poland and fight uh, Polish separatists in, in the German Eastern territories as a Polish separatist tried to take over certain regions in, in Silesia, for example. Um, as the German army was disintegrating, the German uh, police was, uh, was also too weak and the German state was very fragile. At the time, they had to rely on these volunteer formations to, to defend the borders. So the free Koreans were then deployed into into what is today Poland uh, to put down um, insurrections there, and later on a number of them what they they refused to demobilize and they went to fight in the Baltic, in what is today Lithuania, and that's a it, it gets to be a convoluted story. But in 1919, these these militias were up in Germany and there were um, and, and they were basically fighting as a kind of surrogate army to maintain order to enforce government authority. Um, the common narrative of the Free Corps is that they were composed mainly of, of, of soldiers who, uh, who could not demobilize, who'd been brutalized in World War I and could no longer integrate into civilian life. And the story was that, that they were, that these uh, disgruntled and disenfranchised soldiers that, that joined uh, the Free Corps, which was really kind of an anti-democratic proto-nationalist movement. Um, and this was a narrative that the Nazis themselves cultivated, because as you pointed out, Wesley, many members of the Free Corps, they became prominent members of, of the SA and the SS, Heinrich uh, Himmler, for example, Heydrich, um, Ernst Röhm, and ma many other, many other high-ranking Nazis also had uh, belonged to the, to the Free Corps beforehand. 
But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, many Jews also joined the Fry Corps, and unfortunately, the rec- the records we have aren't aren't complete. Many of them were destroyed uh, during World War II by Allied, Allied bombing raids when when German archives uh, were, were destroyed. Um, many more were, you know, as, as Jews were being persecuted and, and they fled, the, these records disappeared. But one area where we do know a lot about is Bavaria. Uh, there, the archives largely uh, survived the war intact. And we know that in, in the, of the Free Corps units raised in Bavaria, um, a very conservative number we have is that there were, there were at least a, a 158 uh, Jews who were serving in, 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 the, in, in, in the handful of units that, that we know about there. Um, Jews, uh, they, 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 they served as, uh, as company and battalion commanders in free corps units. In other places in Germany, they even raised their, their own um, uh, free corps units and, uh, and, and went over and fought Polish uh, separatists. So um, this is a conservative estimate. Again, many of them are, are, are incomplete. And many free corps units, they, they don't record the, uh, the, the religion. Or, or the or the, or the background of, of the of the of the people who joined, so it's impossible really to get a uh, an accurate number. But um, it, again, it's I think it's this comes this is shocking to many people because one of the um, one of the images that that many of us uh, many people have of uh, Jews in World War One is that they belong to the political end of the uh, to the liberal end of the political spectrum, that they stood in fundamental opposition to German nationalism. Um, but even though many Jewish soldiers, returning soldiers and, and Jews, uh, even on the home front, even though they had lost their optimism for the war, that didn't really mean that they had become socialists or Democrats. Um, many Jews, or the majority of Jews, were, were, were middle class, upper middle class. They were shop owners. They, uh, they, they worked in, in, in industry. And, and so they feared a communist takeover. I mean, this was something that was... You know, I mean, a lot of people were really uh, worried about this in, in, in 1919. Um, and they also believed that the new Weimar government was too weak to maintain law and order, to maintain law and order, that it was too weak to prevent um, these communist insurgencies from taking hold. And, and they were right about that. So uh, Jews, too, they were, they were, they, they wanted to uh, prevent a, a, a communist revolution in Germany. And uh, many of them, they did uh, join the Fry Corps. And so this is kind of evidence that this myth we have in the Fry Corps um, also needs to be reevaluated, I think. Yeah, that's, that, that's something I was thinking about kind of while you were talking of like the picture I have in my head of what the Fry Corps was and, and their actions and what they kind of represented is perhaps altered by the place that they would be placed in in like the Nazi creation myth by by the National Socialists themselves, and, mm-hmm. and maybe maybe they altered d- during that time period, sort of how people viewed the Fry Corps and and what was being discussed around those groups, a- as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's interesting today that a lot of the scholarship, um, you know, is is based on the very same myth still that uh, that the Nazis themselves created. I mean, this this direct line from World War One to the Fry Corps to the Nazi Party, uh, this this was created and cultivated by the Nazis themselves after 1933, and yet um, a- after World War Two, we, we, we still kind of um, we're still using this the same narrative, you know, when when we talk about the Fry Corps. <laughs> The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. 
That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, we talk about the Fry Corps and how that leads perhaps into international socialism. And we know where anti-Semitism in Germany goes over the 25 years after the First World War and how it develops during the interwar years as well. Now, with the rise to power of the National Socialist Party and then their ever uh, like increasing persecution that, that, that they sort of threw onto Jews in Germany, did Jewish veterans of the First World War have any kind of protection from those events? Like, Did they experience those sort of anti-Semitic laws differently uh, as they developed over the course of the 1930s? Yeah, really good question, Wesley. And again, it, it's that same question that really um, that, that really drove me years ago uh, to do this uh, research. You know, how, how did how did a, a Jewish former soldier with an iron cross? How did he um, experience you know the Nazi takeover in 1933? Did he suffer uh, persecution the same way that a, a non-military Jew did? That, that's exactly what uh, what has fascinated me for so long. And, and the short answer is, uh, is is yes, they did experience it um the third right differently especially especially the early years and when we um look at jewish writings from this period um contemporary writings and 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 and, and uh, diaries that, that were written at the time um jews jewish veterans like actually like a lot of other jews uh they didn't they didn't take hitler at his at his word they didn't there was no there was no there was no panic there there wasn't a sense of uh of, of wanting to emigrate nobody believed that 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 Hitler would really would really make good on on his promises on all this anti-semitic rhetoric uh that had been spewed out you know the, the past uh the, the past decade um and even more importantly for Jewish veterans is that they believed that they had allies in the in the German government among the German people and that they could endure the the worst of what the Nazis would throw at them and that they could outlast Hitler I mean, no, nobody really believed that Hitler would even be around that long, that, that he, would, he would maybe last a couple of months, a couple of years after all. This is, um, I mean, in the Weimar Republic, there were some cabinets that, that lasted only a, a, a few weeks. Um, and in 1933, I mean, these, these thoughts weren't um, entirely irrational. And we see that in, uh, for the first time during the April boycott, the so-called April boycott on April 1st, 1933, where Goebbels and, and the Nazi leadership, they call a, a nationwide boycott on all Jewish stores. And you have these scenes where these SA men, these stormtroopers, um, in the morning, you know, they go out and, and pick at Jewish uh, shops. And anybody who tries to go in, they were, depending on what region of Germany, of, of course, uh, they were either harassed, sometimes they were photographed, sometimes they were prevented from, uh, from, from going inside. And on April third, and on April first, nineteen thirty-three, throughout Germany, many Jewish veterans they responded to this by um, by uh, by putting on their old war decorations, their iron crosses, and their wound badges from the war, and going out and standing in front of their stores and challenging uh, the Nazi stormtroopers who are picketing uh, their their business. And uh, we have accounts of this happening in, in numerous places in Germany. Um, there's one famous photograph. It's actually on the, if, if you look at the book, it's on the cover. There's also the photograph inside of, of, of Richard uh, Stern who, in Cologne, who, who does this, that. He puts on his iron cross and he goes out and he confronts the stormtrooper who, who's uh, standing in front of his store to, to kind of scare away business. And, and really the opposite happens. It, does, it creates a... A sensation in the town, and, and a crowd gathers, and, and people are wondering why, you know, this this uh, veteran of, of World War One is being harassed, and uh, there are actually people who shop at his store out of protest of of, of these policies, and and it's a, it's a remarkable picture, but um, this was the only one that we have, but it 
It happened um, everywhere throughout Germany. Um, and, uh, and, and so most Germans, they were very upset. I mean, they, they, they didn't know how to respond to this, 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 um, you know, this, this image, this, this view of, of, uh, great war veterans being, uh, harassed by German stormtroopers who were too young to have ever served in the war themselves. Uh, this offended most, uh, Germans who were middle-class and, uh, and, and generally, uh, conservative. And there was a, there, there, there was a backlash to this. And uh, we see this backlash in the first uh, raci- racist laws that were passed uh, that month in 1933, the, uh, the civil service law um, that was passed by Hitler, which expelled all Jewish civil servants from their jobs, teaching jobs, government jobs, all of them were expelled. But just after they passed that, um, President Hindenburg, who was not a philo-Semite by any means um, himself, but uh, but he uh, he intervened on the behalf of Jewish veterans, and he um, uh, he forced Hitler to add a provision to that law, stating that uh, that that uh, that Jewish former soldiers who had fought at the front lines um, and who had been decorated or had been decorated uh, that that they that they would be exempt from any racist legislation. So we see here, you know, 1933, um, uh, you, you see exceptions being made here with with every. Uh, anti-Jewish law that was passed, a provision was added exempting Jewish veterans uh, from those from those measures. So in 1933, Jews, you know, despite you know uh, you know this this persecution that was that was being ramped up, uh, despite all the vile rhetoric that that was that was heard in the streets, they they remained cautiously optimistic because they knew they had allies in the government, conservatives like Hindenburg. They had the allies in the German military. There were, there were certain officers who, were, who also didn't buy into this unrestrained anti-Semitism. Um, and, and the German public also, and during the April boycott, they, uh, they showed some, some uh, solidarity with, with Jewish veterans. This would uh, change later on, of course, and I'd be happy to talk about how, how that changed. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting, though, that, you know, I think we it's easy to fall into the trap of like having this impression that, you know, the anti-Semitism in Germany went from zero to a hundred as soon as Hitler came to power. But it was a scenario where it took years and years of kind of building and, and government propaganda and these, these laws that, that, that are passed through to kind of get to the point later on where even the, these protected members of society, these veterans start to also sort of lose their privileges and, and lose their freedom eventually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly. And Hindenburg, he, uh, as, 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 as you know, he, uh, he died in, in, uh, in, in 1934, in the summer of 1934. And uh, his passing um, allowed Hitler, he, he assumed the role of, of uh, Reich president as well, and he consolidated his power. This is when Germany really became, uh, really became, when Hitler really became a dictator. Um, and all, all, all these last remaining non-Nazi conservative elements, the majority of them were, were finally pushed aside, you know, in, in, in the government. But uh, the interesting thing is, is that most of the exemptions for Jewish veterans, they remained in place until 1938. Many of them were done away with during, during the Nuremberg Laws, um, uh, civil service employment, for example. But until 1938, for example, Jewish doctors... Uh, were state, uh, Jewish doctors who were veterans were state, uh, still able to practice their professions, as were Jewish lawyers who were veterans. They were also able to stay in those uh, professions, and that didn't change until 1938, uh, Kristallnacht. So you mentioned uh, Kristallnacht, and I know that that is kind of a, a, a real turning point when it comes to how, how these Jewish veterans are treated. So, so can you talk about the significance of that date for these veterans, and then what kind of developed after? Yeah, Kristallnacht, it was indeed a turning point. It was a, a, a watershed in every sense of that word. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar um, you know, with, with, with that term, Kristallnacht was the nationwide program that was uh, carried out by the German government against, uh, against Jews on uh, beginning on 9 November 1938. It was a, a two-day program where uh, where members of the SA and, and the SS they uh, they went through through Germany burning synagogues uh, smashing and, 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 and looting Jewish stores 
um, and ar arresting uh, Jewish men. Up to uh, thirty, some you know, some thirty thousand Jewish men were arrested um, during those two nights and ported to concentration camps. And in many ways, uh, this marked a, a turning point, especially for Jewish former soldiers, because um, this was the first time that veterans were not uh, exempted, or it was the first time that that veterans were. Um, were involved in, 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 in some of this major violence. The regime did not make distinctions between different types of Jews on 9 November 1938. Um, it didn't matter if you were uh, a, a wealthy uh, Jewish businessman. It didn't matter if you were um, an, an, an acculturated Jew who had converted to uh, Christianity. It didn't matter if you were a decorated war veteran on Kristallnacht. Uh, they were all targeted and, uh, and veterans who were among 30,000 Jewish men who were deported to concentration camps. And, 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 and the message the regime was trying to send was very clear. Um, it, it, was, it, it meant that there'd be no more exceptions and that all Jews would be the same in Nazi Germany, that there would be uh, no more distinctions. But um, again, here, you know, this, if, if, you, if, you look, if you look at the accounts, if you look at the police reports, for example, and if you look at some of the testimonies that were written um, immediately um, after the pogrom, we see that the veterans' experiences, again, were, uh, were, were significantly different. I'm going to give one example um, that's, uh, that's, that's out of the book, um, um, and, um, the, the case of Julius Kutzmann, who was a Jewish businessman, the co-owner of a business in Würzburg, a, a town in, or a small city in uh, Franconia, northern Bavaria. And until 1938, um, Julius Kutzmann appeared to be living a, a normal middle class existence as his business was still solvent. And as a matter of fact, in 1913, his business was actually still doing fairly well. Um, Redsburg was a garrison town. There was, uh, there was an infantry regiment stationed there, also an artillery regiment. And uh, Kutzmann was a, a veteran of, of World War I. He volunteered to become an officer. He'd earned both classes of the Iron Cross. And he uh, had several friends of his who were uh, serving in the army in the, in the Wehrmacht at the time. So he had connections to the military garrison there. Um, despite that, though, his, he, his home was broken into by the SS. He was uh, arrested, eventually ended up in a Gestapo prison and deported to Buchenwald concentration camp, along with hundreds of other Jews, hundreds of other Jews from Würzburg. But uh, here, here's where it gets interesting. Um, a couple of days after Kutzman was arrested, um, his employees of his uh, firm, 25 of them, they got together and they crafted a petition, a petition that each one of them uh, contains their name and signature. They, they each signed it and they sent the petition to the Reich Chancellery in Berlin, to, to, to Hitler. And they requested that Kutzman be released. And, and the reason and they listed the reasons why, you know, foremost being that he had served um, as an officer in World War I. He had also served as in the, in, in the Fry Corps as well, by the way. And he had been a steadfast supporter of conservative uh, political causes during the Weimar Republic. And because of all these things, but especially because of a service in the army, they claimed that, uh, quote unquote, he had proven his Germanness. And he was not unlike, and, and he, was, he had nothing in common with these other Jews who, of course, deserve to be arrested and, and, and deported. And, and this is a narrative we hear a lot, you know, that, uh, that service in the war would, would, would prove, you know, shows that this, this person had proven his Germans. They also sent a copy of the letter to Munich, uh, to, the governor, uh, to the governor general in Munich, the governor of Bavaria at the time. And the remarkable thing is that this petition was successful. Um, Kutzmann was released. Um, about uh, about a week later, about a week after he was arrested and sent to Buchenwald, he was uh, freed again, and he was able to emigrate to the United States about uh, about a year later. And this is really the only successful petition I've ever seen, uh, the only instance of collective action during Kristallnacht by uh, Germans on, on, on behalf of a, of, a, of, a, of a Jew who had been um, arrested and detained that night. And this was really a pattern we see um, after 1938, really until 1942, where uh, as, as the deportation starting, uh, started, you see uh, Jewish veterans, as they were ordered to report to the train station to, uh, to, and, and report 
uh, to be deported to a concentration camp in the East, you would see colleagues, uh, most of the time former officers or regime officials, uh, petition the SS or petition the government uh, to make an exception uh, for their for their comrade for this uh, for this for this Jewish man who they had served with or they had known. And uh, this this uh, this ended, of course, um, January 1942 during the on the um, uh, during the Vanze Conference, where it was uh, where it was uh, stipulated that all Jewish veterans were not to be sent to Auschwitz or other labor camps in the East. They would be sent to a privileged camp in what is today Czech, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, which is Theresienstadt. Thank you so much for joining me here for, for the interview today. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you, Wesley. It was a real pleasure uh, to be here. And again, I think you have a new uh, follower on your podcast here. Excellent. Hope it lives up to expectations. <laughs> thank you, Wesley. Thank you, everybody.